Well, hello and welcome to Just a Thought, Sunshine Cathedral's Saturday uh, chat that we have with me, Darrell Watkins, Sunshine Cathedral Senior Minister, and with the Reverend Cindy Lippert, <clears throat> who is uh, a mistress of all trades. Uh, <laughs> she, is, she, she is all things to all people. She is a, a minister and a model and an actor and a life coach. Uh, and uh, this week, a mover of boxes. Uh, <laughs> because she's moving from Phoenix to Albuquerque. Still, right. still a Western gal, but there you have it. Um, so uh, if you're new uh, or uh, this, is, this is where we discuss a thought, just a thought, uh, usually a quote from some great thinker, some metaphysician or leader or spiritual writer. And uh, then we riff on it. See, we're, we're just uh, pondering the, the uh, thought will take us. Uh, and our quote today comes from Emmett Fox. Emmett Fox was a divine science minister. Mm -hmm. He was, um, he was Irish. He uh, was Roman Catholic. He had actually considered being a, a priest and uh, wound up being a new thought minister. He was a very successful speaker and minister in, uh, during the depression. Uh, he, uh, in a rented hall, uh, the Hippodrome, I believe, uh, in New York, had what was the largest religious gathering on a Sunday morning, uh, one of the largest in the United States, maybe the largest. He attracted about 5,000 people every week, which, you know, in the 30s, uh, that was that was quite something. Now we got mega churches, and, you know, there's lots of four and eight and 10 and 12,000 member churches, but uh, those were not common in the 30s, and he had one. Uh, there wasn't a lot of infrastructure to the church. It was mostly for uh, uh, his motivational speaking, uh, some midweek classes. Uh, I think they took the summer off even. It was almost like a, like a school. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but still people would pack the theater to hear him speak. Uh, he was a, a, a prolific writer, a divine scientist. And uh, in fact, his, uh, some of his writings were very influential in the early days of the uh, AA movement. Uh, his uh, writing also uh, was one of the influences on Norman Vincent Peale, the, the writer of The positive, uh, Power of Positive Thinking. So Emmett Fox, big deal. Everyone loves Emmett. Uh, he's, he's a favorite for many of us. And th this is one of the, the things uh, Emmett said. Whenever you are afraid of something, you are worshiping it. Whenever you are afraid of something, you are worshiping it. Whatever you fear, you bow down to and give it power. I'm, I, I'm gonna read it one more time. The whole thing, take notes, write this down. <laughs> this, is, this is good stuff, right? Wow. Whenever you are afraid of something, you are worshiping it. Whatever you fear, you bow down to and give it power. What about that, Cindy Lippert? I think it is a perfect follow-up to last week. We talked about fear, and I mentioned uh, that we were selling our house, and it would be easy to get involved in who's going to buy my house, right? Mm -hmm. And you and I ended our broadcast, and uh, we debriefed with each other and had some wonderful, inspiring words. And then my husband said, by the way, somebody's coming to look at the house. Yeah. And they bought the house. And they bought the so house. So now we're packing this week. So it's it's exactly that. And what did I say last week? It was <laughs> something about the work, the work became less about marketing the house and more about doing the spiritual work. And right. the spiritual work is about identifying I'm afraid instead of I'm in gratitude. Yeah. We um, <clears throat> usually debrief after these chats, just a few minutes or whatever. And sometimes the debriefing, like if an issue comes up, includes uh, praying. Although if somebody were bugging the room or if the security camera was on and they saw us, they might miss that we were praying. They might not know that that's <laughs> what we had done. Right, because you know our prayer looks a lot like just agreeing with with a principle of truth, uh, just sharing words of love or encouragement, or 
uh, just uh, re tuning in again, re re replugging into a, a, vi a shared vision. And so our prayers are usually very brief and very informal, and uh, and people might not know that that was uh, what we were doing. And yet we've gotten a lot of results over the years, uh, practitionering with each other in just such a manner. So I, and the reason that even comes up for me is that one of the things I get a lot from people is that they're actually even afraid that they're praying wrong. And I don't know that you can get it wrong. Uh, you can you can block the results. You can ignore the results. You can retard the results. Uh, you you can miss the results. The results can come and you not notice them. I mean, there's a lot of things, but you can't get the prayer wrong. You're going to have a wish. You're going to have a desire. You're going to have a moment of gratitude. You're going to have an observation. You're going to have a, a, a deep thought. Prayer is going to happen. Uh, so all of our formulas and techniques and methods of prayer is just trying to become more aware of what we're doing, doing it more intentionally, and being aware of what happens as a result. And so, uh, and I know you said your mentor, uh, Ann Kunath, who was the founder of United Divine Science, it was one of the newer uh, uh, divine science movements, sort of bringing all the old school to philosophies together in a united uh, sort of way. And that's actually our tradition, uh, you and I as divine scientists, that your mentor, Ann, same thing, that you would just, uh, you would just declare a thing, you would just agree, you would just, uh, and things would happen. So, um, and I love long, beautiful, meditative treatments. I, I love poetic and prose, you know, poetry and prose as prayers. I, you know, I love ritual. I love when people sling the incense and the holy water and light the candles. I mean, I just don't think you can get it wrong. Uh, and I know people that will say, no, you gotta use these five steps or these six steps or these seven steps and in this order. And if that makes you happy, please do. And I do those things too sometimes. And sometimes I call up my friend Cindy Lippert and I say, this is what I want. And Cindy Lippert says, done. And that's our prayer session. Right. <laughs> well, I learned I learned this from Anne. And Anne was uh, mentored by the great Catherine Ponder. Ponder yes. Most people are more familiar with Catherine than Anne. But Anne would call and say, OK, I need your agreement on something. And we, we know the ancient texts tell us when two or more are gathered together in the name and in the nature of the Christ, it is done. Yeah. And it makes me so mad when I forget, when I don't utilize the truth that I know. Right. I was born into a religious family. I was born into a religious culture. I'm 53. So I've been steeped in religion. Religion is in my bones. Religion is in my DNA uh, my whole life. And I started flirting with, looking at, beginning to study metaphysics at around the age 20. So for about 33 years, I've been a metaphysical student. Um, how could I forget? <laughs> like, I don't forget, you know, I, it's like saying, you know, oh, I forgot to floss my teeth ever. Or, you know, I forgot to like, something should just be so automatic, right? Yeah. And, yeah. But I forget. And then well, there's this joy in relearning or rediscovering or remembering. Yeah. And that's what my spiritual journey is mostly about, is remembering what I had for some reason chosen to forget. And then it's all great and new and wonderful again. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm at this a long time and I forget. Well, uh, Joel Goldstein in his book, Practicing the Present, says there will come a day when we are not reciting affirmations and denials. We are not doing this ritual. It becomes so ingrained in the way that we think. I'm often surprised that others that don't know me from the ministry days are surprised at the way I respond to things because of that, because it's second nature. Do you remember <laughs> we we sat on a board, the same board once, uh, <laughs> and you know these religious boards or whatever you yeah. you got to act religious, you know. So there's like, oh, Reverend <laughs> Cindy, will you open us in prayer? And I'll never forget the day that you said no. <laughs> <laughs> Just not gonna do it. Nope. Nope. <laughs> and I, I think some other great luminary, you know, Dr. Mary Tompkins <laughs> or somebody had to do it because Cindy Lippert would not. So, no. <laughs> you know, I I don't remember the circumstances, but I know it was me. It was I know you. it was me. 
Yeah. I laughed so hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So nope. it was always why I like was I was so drawn to you. Because I've <laughs> never done it. I've never done metaphysics properly. <laughs> no. And I yeah. finally found someone who could resonate with that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but if we're, you know, Brother Lawrence, uh, after he died, uh, he was he was a barefoot friar, a monk. And he would teach people. He was like the kitchen monk. I mean, he like he washed the dishes and cut the vegetables. And he it turns out he was like one of the wisest people in the world. And yeah. so people would come for advice and prayer. And people would take notes right now. And then when he died, a, a lot of things he had taught and counseled with people got written down into a book. And it's called The Practice of the Presence of God. Oh, yeah. Gold, uh, Goldstein wrote something with, by a similar title, which is what even made me think of Brother Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And so Brother Lawrence's whole thing was just life is just communication with God. It's just being aware that God is present. It's almost like this Zen thing of, you know, when you're washing dishes, wash the dishes. Uh, when you're, you, you know, when you're, when you're cutting flowers, cut the flowers, like be present in what you're doing. And that's, that's communion, be present, experience it fully in that moment. And that's what communion is. And so if we're practicing the presence of God, if we are fully aware of God's presence in us and around us and flowing through us and expressing as us, and we're not, we forget, like I said, we forget, right? You said we forget, but when we don't forget, when we are aware in that moment that I'm in the presence of God, I am, I love, I've stolen this from you and I've used it several times. So I'm gonna stop giving you credit, it's mine now. Uh, where God drops, right? That, that, that all, of, all of the ocean is in the drop. And so we're drops in the divine ocean where God drops and God is in us fully. This incarnation, this expression, this, this level of consciousness isn't all that God is. And yet all that God is, is me. It's, uh, it, and in the moments that I remember that, what formula or prayer or ritual or, or verbiage could make any of that better? I say the words or I light the candle well, I'm or I bow before the Buddha or whatever to get me in the right consciousness. If I'm in the consciousness, what's there to add? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the late, great um, uh, Roy Eugene Davis, uh, the Western founder of Kriya Yoga. And uh, as you know, I sat on a board with him for International New Thought. And I said to him one day after our meeting, Roy, mm -hmm. I've got to come to Georgia and learn from you how to meditate. And he said, oh, I can teach you that in five minutes. And, I, <laughs> and he has these big retreats and he goes all over the world. And, you know, and by the way, you may recall, Roy never charged for any of his meetings ever. There was never a charge. You could make a love offering mm -hmm. and most absolutely did, but and he, he had never a charged. Life. He trusted the universe yes. And, yes. and he had a comfortable life. He traveled all over uh you know working teaching or whatever but he yeah. like he just never he seemed to worry about money right it seemed to come to him yeah. i remember at his workshops he would sell these books reasonably priced books 10 12 dollars reasonably priced books uh and uh, at the end of the workshop if there were books left he said okay if you didn't buy a book take one off the table the people who bought right. it made that possible <laughs> right that's the way he lived his life and well, be like, what yeah. well, <laughs> but yeah. he, did. he would just like thank you for buying a book someone who couldn't now gets to have a book yeah, okay. yeah. Well, the and point he about wonder, he made it simple. Yeah, the point about him saying I can teach you meditation in five minutes, uh, he went on, and I think it was at at one of the um, workshops that you and I went to, where we got our first initiation from him, and um, he said uh, it doesn't matter if you sit in a lotus position with your legs crossed or whatever. Goldsmith, who I mentioned earlier, and you did. Uh, Goldsmith, he said, could just go out, just boom. He would just sit and be, and I, I was so excited to hear that because that's me. That's me. I've never had any trouble. Meditation comes very easily to me, but others need a mantra. They need sutras. They need position. They need all music, all of it. And that's okay. And it's but all according, available. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Roy was, of course, Yogananda's last living disciple. And I, I take what Roy taught us as pure gold, and it made sense to me. It isn't about the form. It, it's yeah. about being present. The, uh, when I, uh, I'll invite people to come to our little physical chats or whatever. 
And sometimes they'll say, yeah, but I'm Buddhist. Like, I'm not really like new thought, you know, whatever, or, mm-hmm. or uh, you know, I'm, I'm Kriya Yoga. And is that new thought or is it not? Like, I, people aren't sure, you know, whatever. Or, uh, you know, of course in miracles, this, you know, a lot of people, is, is that new thought or is that new age wow. or is that psychology? Yeah. Or, and I'm yeah. always like, none of that matters to me. I mean, I realize that it's a big deal to a lot of other people. Yeah. Uh, but wisdom and love and joy uh, and communion with the sacred, that's all one thing. And we have all these different names for it and all these different traditions and all of the, you know, and that's all great, but that's for us. Yeah. You know, sling the incense, don't sling the incense. Shout hallelujah, sit, you know, to <laughs> quiet. Meet yeah. on Friday, meet on Saturday, meet on Sunday. That's all for us. That makes us comfortable. That's fun for us. Yeah. The one thing that is that we're all part of couldn't care less what we call it or how many steps we put in our prayer or, you know, what day of the week we call special. <laughs> that's all for us. That's and, right. uh, and so universalist, pluralist, they get that. They're like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, so I can play with you. But the purists, they never know what to do with me. They think I am neither fish nor fowl. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> but if you believe in omnipresence, it's all God. And if it's all God, how can you get it wrong? Well, that's the point. And that's why you and I can sit in any church, Catholic, Protestant, whatever. And if spirit is there, you and I get the message. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when those that are caught up in the form uh, are, I think, missing missing the the real meaning and uh and maybe that's okay for them because i believe as many different ones as there are of us there are that many different pathways to god Mm -hmm. and so we don't condemn any of them as long as they're not killing people and hurting people in the process of what they call their religion yes if you if it gives you hope if it gives you joy and if it isn't weaponized against anyone else right i just think it's all good better and best yes (laughs) Well, that's, you know, that's the point. We need, we need more love and hope in the world more than anything, especially right now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, New Thought for me was a pathway to understanding spirit in a way that for whatever reason didn't resonate with me before. And this may be for some people. There are some that listen to our broadcasts and get lost because we're mentioning a lot of terminology they've never heard before. And uh, my advice is don't get bogged down with that because when ministers speak to each other, we're doing a lot of shorthand and, um, and you know, that, that makes no sense to the rest of the world. And this is a chat. This is a conversation. Right. And yes. so you don't have to hang on every word. If a word right. goes by that didn't grab you, there's another word coming. Just listen for there's, that one. Don't, like, don't even get, this is, you know, in conversations, you sort of check out or whatever and yeah. come back into it. We never listen to a hundred. Yeah. So if something you know, does it make sense to you? You can look it up if you want to, or just listen to the next thing, because uh, it's well, a flow, it's a conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah, and the, the thing is, and the point, and I don't want it lost today, is we're, you know, you and I are all for, for new thought and all of its varieties. Uh, what I think has hurt uh, the message is the literalism and the insistence on, you um, being very specific and a particular people ask me what is the difference between divine science religious science you know centers for spiritual living uh kriya yoga um you know christian science whatever and um and christian science isn't technically new thought there we go with another hair splitting but uh the point is that i my final answer is is there is not one whit of difference to most people or that matters. Yeah. It is only those of us who, who are crazy enough about religious philosophy to understand the nuance and find that entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Tim Stewart, who is the president of Divine Science Federation, he says, because he's a pluralist, he, he came from Pentecostalism to to metaphysics to religious science to divine science. I mean, he's one of these journey, uh, religious journeymen, and he says, for those who have studied multiple traditions, they find the similarities. Yes. For those who only had one and and hitched their wagon to it, that you know they're looking for differences to prove how theirs is the best or the right or the most original yeah. or you know whatever. But for those who who have experienced them all, they're like, hey, this is what these other guys were saying, and this is the, yeah. that uh, that the more you've been exposed to, the more similar they all 
seem to. And that is certainly my experience. Yeah, um, mine too. Well, I, as you know, I came from a Baptist tradition and, um, and then uh, studied a lot of the occult and, uh, and finally uh, was mentored by a former Pentecostal woman who taught me new thought in a way that most new thoughters didn't even understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing led to another course of miracles and all of it and got me to unity, which got me to divine science, which got me back to unity and ultimately to you. <laughs> so, you know, it's a circuitous route. And all of this, I mean, we've been talking about, you know, sort of metaphysics writ large, but all from the metaphysician that got us going on this Emmett Fox, who was talking about fear. And I think fear... Fear is probably what got me into New Thought uh, because New Thought started as a healing movement. It branched out into, you know, a life movement. You know, how can I pay my bills more easily or how can I have my, my relationships be happier? Or, you know, it became a life philosophy, but it started as a healing movement. And, um, you know, I found I my first New Thought church was a unity church, uh, stumbled into it. I worked on Sundays. It was next door to my job. And so the way I could go to church was to go there um, because I could go slip out right at, at the end and be at work. And so I'm like, I don't know what the, I don't know what Christ way unity is about, but it's convenient. And if they're not mean to me or deadly doll, I'll have a place to go to church and life changed. Uh, it was, yeah. And, but it was also during, it was the eighties. It was during the, the beginning of the AIDS crisis. Uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the state I lived in, and there were about 14 of them that similar, uh, it was it, every time I went on a date as a same gender loving person, I was breaking the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a, there was a lot of, uh, it, I was, uh, you know, 18, 19 or whatever. So just coming out. And so there was a lot of fear in my life, you know, uh, and just, you know, starting adulthood, you know, so like, what if I fail uh, at life? Uh, what if I get sick? Uh, what if, uh, you know, what if people reject me and I'm alone all my life, you know, so I had all these years. And, um, and so I sort of turned to new thoughts to overcome my fears. Uh, mostly fears about, uh, you know, uh, looking for hope in what was a hopeless situation in the early days of the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, so, and then for years, I think I followed the formulas and I was trying to find a way to always beat the odds and come out on top when things were scary. But over the years of practice, going to peace instead of to pieces is more and more my goal. I still expect, I still want to be healthy in mind and body. I still want to be able to pay all my bills. I still want all my friends to like me. <laughs> I still want to make new friends. I, you know, I still want all the good things in life. Um, and yet that I'm not primarily looking for those in my spiritual search. I'm looking for a constant awareness that God and I are one and that God is good and that there's good for me and I ought to have it. And, uh, you know, I'm looking, I'm just trying to go to peace and sit at pieces more often than not. And with the same results then, I mean, my focus has shifted and yet I still tend to, you know, experience a lot of good things. Um, but I think fear sometimes is what motivates us to look because we're looking for miracles. We're looking for magic. We're looking for, uh, you know, the, the secret room or the, uh, the, the, the exit or the, or, or the bunker, or, you know, we're looking for that thing that's going to keep us safe. And, but if we stick with it long enough, I think we move past that. And we get to, you know, where Jesus said, seek first the realm of God, the presence of God, the experience of God. And then all this other stuff seems to happen. It seems to work out. All these things will be added to you. And that has certainly been my metaphysical journey that well, to uh, turning to it for like the hope of healing. And then in the process, discovering, it's all good no matter what happens. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, fear is bringing up what really sold me on the New Thought idea. And that was uh, Marianne Williamson's book. And what she did is she talks about in that book, uh, Perfect Love Casts Out All Fear. And why this was profound for me is I was asking every New Thought minister I could find, what metaphysically does the devil mean and nobody could translate that for me now i know there's a lot of ministers that are going to listen to this well you should call me well i don't believe that 
because I probably asked you. Yeah. <laughs> but Marianne Williamson said it in a way that it made sense to me. If you take the word devil, enemy, whatever the scripture says, Satan, uh, you know, Golgotha, whatever, and uh, translate that word fear for fear, suddenly it makes sense. Perfect love casts out all fear. In other words, uh, fear and love, and this was Marianne's explanation, fear and love cannot reside in the same space at the same time. There's only room for one. And it was like a light bulb went off. If you are in a state of hate for your fellow human or anybody or anything, love transmutes that. Yeah. Well, God is on God. If God is all there is, and God is love, then in reality, love is all there is. Mm -hmm. And fear is the opposite of love. It's not hate, it's fear. I, I wouldn't hate something I wasn't afraid of. Like, so every negative thing is really the child of fear. So hate love and hate are the only two things and hate doesn't exist. I mean, love and fear are the only two things and fear doesn't exist. It's, it, it's an illusion. It's a deception. And you know, that people say, oh, the devil is, is the prince of lies, a liar and the father of lies. Well, yeah, it's deception. That's, that's what fear is. Yeah. And uh, so Zig Ziglar said, fear can mean forget everything and run or face everything and rise. Uh, we've also heard, you know, that, that fear can stand for false evidence appearing real. Um, so yeah, if, if God is love and, and God is all there is, then love is all there is. So the whole journey is about, and of course, miracles teaches this, that a miracle is a change of perception from fear to love. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, nothing is a problem if you're not afraid of it. No, it was like us selling our house. The minute you and I talked, it, there was a shift and, you know, the case can be made. Well, the buyer already existed. Well, that's what we had said. We affirmed that the buyer was alive and well on planet earth being magnetized to my house right now and emerging that the, the whole situation was emerging now. And, and we stood in gratitude for that. And sure enough, I got out of my own way and, uh, and then the miracle was allowed to take place. Yeah. So what's the, what's the takeaway? What's the, what's the bottom line? Well, it's all God, so it's all good. <laughs> I think so. Nothing and nobody stands in the way or interferes with my possessing all that is mine by divine birthright, not even me. Not even me. And you, you, you uh, shared that, that affirmation last week, too. Well, so we've run a little over, but I think we needed to. I think we were supposed to this week. Um, this is a, I knew Emmett would get us going. So let's, uh, it's just, it's just the thought, but I think it's worth hearing again. So let's, let's end the way we started with these words of Emmett Fox. Whenever you are afraid of something, you're worshiping it. You're giving it all your attention. You're making it the most important thing in that moment. That's what worship is, right? So whenever you are afraid of something, you are worshiping it. Whatever you fear, you bow down to and give it power. So I guess when we heal the fear, We've really healed everything. Yep. And it's just a thought, but it's one that uh, I keep coming back to. Yeah. And uh, my goal is to, I mean, I'll always probably have to come back to it, but my goal is to hold it longer and longer each time because <laughs> things go well when I remember. It's true. Yeah. Absolutely true. Well, all right. Thanks, Cindy Lippert. We did it again. Yay. I guess we'll do it again next week. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the next time, or certainly the time after that, you'll be a resident of a whole new place. I know. Next, next, uh, a week, a week from today, we're loading the truck. Oh, wow. You're going to be able to carve out half hour for us, aren't you? Uh, somehow. With, with, <laughs> It'll work yep. somehow. <laughs> you may be doing it with your phone like this in the car, but whatever. That could be. <laughs> we can do it. We can do it. All right. All right. Well, thanks again. Bye-bye.